like this. I mean, here was the floor plan that we were looking at. Like I said, it was pretty simple. Um, but we were taking that floor plan and looking at a uh, 20 pounds per square foot load. And given that load, how do you determine all of this stuff? What are the reactions, the shears, and the moments? Uh, and hopefully that stuff made sense or was fairly clear. Um, so if I gave you a structure like this and gave you a load, hopefully you should be able to determine, you know, what's the shear on this beam or the bending moment on this girder or so on and so forth. So everybody okay with that? Any questions? So I, I think probably the one, I guess, detail that hasn't been discussed is where does the 20 PSF come from? Like, I, I picked 20 pounds per square foot for this problem just because I felt it was a nice round number and it, and it made sense, but, but why 20? Why wasn't it 50 or 80 or 96.2? Why, why that number? Um, well, what I want to do is talk about the loads themselves. Where do we get them? Where do we cut? Where do they come from? Uh, and the different types of loads that we deal with uh, as structural engineers. Now, um, there's a series of resources that you can get structural loads from, and we'll talk about a few of them um, uh, you know, during today's lecture. But I'd argue probably one of the most fundamental ones for us is uh, ASC 7. ASC 7 is the, um, the, the document that uh, delineates the minimum design loads for buildings and other structures here in the United States. Now, ASCE, and I, I, we talked about this in steel design as well, but ASCE uh, is far more than just a student club on, on college campuses that does canoes and bridges. I mean, yeah, they do that, um, but they're a professional organization that provides a, a, a litany of services for us as civil engineers. And one of those services is to provide technical standards by which we should operate. Um, and so where these documents come from are basically all of the experts in these various fields coming together and saying, this is the appropriate floor load for an office building. This is the appropriate wind speed in Ames, Iowa, and, and so on and so forth. Using all of that data and that expertise uh, and what have you, and publishing it in a document that we all as engineers can use. Now, I'm not going to use ASC 7 directly, but I'm going to pull probably the most critical um, components of ASC 7 that you would deal with, not just as practicing engineers, but even stuff that you might see on the FE exam. Um, one very common problem that you'll deal with on the exam, uh, or potentially deal with on the exam, uh, is a problem dealing with live load reduction. And so I want you to understand what that is. I want you to understand how to do it, because it's really simple, but I don't want you to see and go, oh, man, what is this? Uh, and plus, this is something that you would deal with uh, in the field uh, as well. Uh, but we're going to take it one step at a time, and we're going to talk about loads. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about loads and start with dead loads. Dead loads um, are probably the one force effect that is guaranteed to be resisted by every structure that's ever existed ever in the history of ever. Because um, dead loads essentially um, uh, consist of any permanent attachment, but the most common example and the most verse, or the most you know, well-seen example in any structural system that's ever been built is a structure's own self-weight. Uh, 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 all structures must be able to support their own self-weight. Okay. Um, I tend to not, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't like really the terms dead loads and live loads. I sort of uh, prefer the terms permanent and transient loads, but that's a, a mouthful, so dead and live tends to be uh, what everybody uses. But in other words, dead loads are stationary. They don't move. Any load on the structure that is stationary, that doesn't move, that's permanent, that's a dead load. Um, and if we're talking about self-weight and we're talking about civil engineering structures, the most common materials that we use in civil engineering are steel and concrete. Okay? Now, um, if you've had fluids uh, and or if you're in hydraulics, you know, one of those numbers that sort of gets burned into the back of your head is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, unit weight of water, right? That's one of those numbers that's like, I don't care. You're not leaving an undergraduate program in civil engineering without remembering that number. Well, here's a couple numbers I'm going to make you remember. The unit weight of steel and the unit weight of concrete. By the time we're done, you'll know these numbers. Structural steel has a unit weight of 490 pounds per cubic foot. Okay? And that is how we estimate the weight of steel, you know, period, on a structure. Now, concrete, concrete to, to be honest, the unit weight is variable. It depends on how much gravel, how much sand, you know, admixture, cement, water, all that jazz. Um, typical normal weight concrete 
weighs about 145 pounds per cubic foot, but we're not dealing usually with just concrete, we're dealing with reinforced concrete, steel in the concrete. And so typically what we do is um, we bump that unit weight up a little bit to account for the steel in there, and so a very typical value to assume for the unit weight of normal weight concrete, reinforced concrete I should say, is 150 pounds per cubic foot. Now there are instances where you could use lightweight concrete um, or, or, or different types of aggregate to reduce the weight uh, of, that, uh, of that material, uh, and there are applications for that. But most of the time, normal weight reinforced concrete you know, is typically what you're going to use, and 150 uh, is a very common number. So those two numbers I really expect you to remember, particularly this one for in here, the 150. We're going to have a lot of instances in here where we're going to have to determine the weight of a beam, and so you need to know that number, so just commit that to memory. Now, um, other weights or other components of dead load are, uh, are, are the, the structure itself, not just the, the frame, but everything else. So, for instance, if we're looking at common floor dead loads, maybe the, the framing, the fireproofing, the metal deck, so for instance, the, you know, if you have stay-in-place formwork, formwork for your floor slabs that stays there after the structure is uh, as completed. We have the floor finishes, so we're talking about ceramic tile, slate, um, gypsum fill, we're talking about suspended ceiling, uh, all of you know, you know like the, the, the suspended ceiling up here, mechanical and electrical, the lights, the plumbing, all of that stuff. All that stuff that doesn't move, that stays there from day in, day out, those are considered dead loads. Now there, like I said, ASC7 is a common resource Another common resource is the manufacturer themselves. In other words, Marshall bought this suspended ceiling from somebody, right? And so some company manufactures this stuff. And so when they bought this from Suspended Ceiling Incorporated or whoever they bought this from, they have a catalog that lists their products and with those products they're going to say how heavy this stuff is, okay? And so you can look that stuff up. You, you don't really look a lot of people don't really look at this stuff when they go to Lowe's and they pull out tiles. It's on there. They'll tell you how heavy this stuff is, okay? So, you know, I argue one of the best resources to determine something like dead load is not really so much ASC7, but the actual manufacturer. Um, if you're using concrete, if you're the one designing the mix, you're going to know how heavy it is, so that's probably going to be a better resource. Now, the stuff in ASC7, they report a lot of common stuff, and like, for example, the, the unit weight of like brick, like it, it's the unit weight of brick. It, you could probably get a value from a manufacturer, but by and large, it's going to be 99.9% .9 the same value that, that you get from ASC7. ASC7 just aggregates a lot of that stuff into a single resource. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and another thing to notice is that all of these tend to be reported in pounds per square foot, like we had on our previous example. So, for instance, if you're using quarter inch ceramic tiles, so you know you've have your bathroom in your house that's tiled or, or whatnot. How much does that tile weigh? Well, every square foot of that tile is assumed to weigh about uh, 10 pounds. Um, that might be an upper value, might be a, a higher end estimate, but we're talking about structural engineering. And so when in doubt, be a little conservative. And that's another thing with, with ASC7. Usually these documents tend to report upper bound values for stuff like this, because in design mode, you want to be conservative. Does that make sense? Okay, now that's dead loads. Um, one other thing I do want to talk about is being self-weight before we get into live loads. Now I want, to, I want to just walk through this calculation real quick because this is going to be a very, very common calculation that we do in here and I just want to make sure this makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I have a beam over here, right? I have this beam and it's um, just a rectangular prism, right? So the volume of this beam would be B times H times L. Make sense? That's the volume. So how would I determine the total weight of that beam? Well, I would take the volume of that beam and I would multiply it by the unit weight, right? You have concrete that weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot, multiply it by the volume in cubic feet and you've got the pounds, right? Now, that's great and everything. That'll tell you the total weight of, of the element. And that stuff's important, too. I mean, if I'm a crane operator, I'd kind of like to know how heavy that beam is because I need to know what I'm picking up, right? So I'm not to say it's not important. It is. But for our purposes as designers, the total weight doesn't really matter. 
Uh, and here's why, because if I've got the, the, the beam like this, here's the beam, and I've got a beam that weighs, you know, 4,000 pounds, I'm typically not going to say, okay, that's my model. I'm not going to say, okay, it's a simply supported beam with a 4,000 pound load right in the middle. That wouldn't really be reflective of how the beam uh, behaves. It's not like this beam is light as a feather, light as a feather, light as a feather, light as a feather, and then there's suddenly 4,000 pounds right in the middle. That's not what the beam looks like. Technically, if I was to try and take that self-weight and model it, I'd probably model it like this. I'd model it as a distributed load. Does that make sense? So if this is 4,000 pounds, let's, let's see if y'all can do that. If this is 20 foot and the total beam weight is 2,000 pounds, or, or sorry, 4,000 pounds, what do you think this value should be? What should that be so that this matches the total weight? How would you do that? Yeah, so if the total, if the beam weighs 4,000 pounds and I wanted to model it as a distributed load and the beam's 20 foot long, how do you do that? Divided by its length. Divided by its length. So 4,000 divided by 20 and probably be like 200 pounds per foot. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? That's going to be a far more reasonable way of modeling the self weight of that beam. Does that make sense? So what I'm going to do is take this weight and I'm going to divide it by its length. Make sense? So how did I determine the total weight? I, I took the unit weight and I multiplied it by the volume, right? So that was the unit weight times B times H times L, right? So I'm going to take that total weight and I'm going to divide it by the length. What happens to the lengths? They cancel, right? So, in other words, if I want to determine the weight of a beam, if I want to determine the weight of a beam as a distributed load, a real quick way of doing it is to take the unit weight and multiply it by the area, okay? Just the B times the H. In other words, if I remember the secret weapons, samurai sword or lightsaber if you're a sci-fi fan, if I cut through the section of the beam and I look at that beam, that beam's going to have a cross-sectional area. I take that cross-sectional area and I multiply it by the unit weight, that tells me the pounds per foot, the distributed weight of that beam that I can use for analysis. Does that make sense? We're going to do that a lot in here, so I just want to make sure, like, at, by the time we get to, like, week seven or week eight, we're not even going to put any thought into it, we're just going to do it. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. That's going to be a very, very um, uh, common example. Okay, let's talk about live loads. So I would argue every single structure is going to be subjected to dead load just because of the fact that all structures must be able to withstand their all self or their own self weight. I would also argue that every structure is going to be subjected to some form of live load. And the reason why is because we're building structures for a purpose. We're not just building them just so they can sit there and, and collect dust. In other words, if I'm building a bridge, I'm building it for a reason, so that it will carry traffic. If I'm building a, a, a hospital, I'm building that hospital so that it will carry doctors and patients. It's going to be used for something. Okay? So if dead load is the self-weight of the system, the live load are the forces in the system that are related to what it's being used for. So sometimes live loads are called occupancy loads because they are about what the structure is being used for. If, they're, if it's a school, the live loads would be the students and the, the tables and the computers and so on and so forth. If it's a hospital, it's the doctors, the patients, the MRI machines, uh, all of the, the, the stretchers and, and medical equipment and, and so on and so forth. If it's an ice skating rink, it's the, the, the rink itself, it's the, 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 the skaters or the hockey players or the people in there and, and, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Now, how do you... How do you determine, like, what's an appropriate live load for a classroom? What's the appropriate live load for a surgical wing in a hospital? What's the appropriate live load for a prison? Well, if, if we just started asking that question without any resources, we could probably all just guess a value. And, and to be honest, without any additional information, there's no way to know whether or not we're right or wrong. 
And that's where the value of something like ASC7 comes into play. When these, these numbers that they report, they come from actually going out to hospitals, to prisons, to schools, to all these different buildings, actually recording, okay, these are the live loads and, 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 and responses these buildings are actually seeing. So if you're going to design an office building, you need to be using this. Or if you're going to design a school, you need to be using this. Um, so that's, that's where a lot of these values come from. Here are some, just, just a, a snippet uh, of those values that would be, uh, uh, that would be uh, uh, common. Now, for instance, if you're designing, let's say, an office building, you do have to be cognizant of where the beam is. In other words, um, the offices have a little bit of a lower load than the hallways. Hallways tend to have a more dense concentration of people at a given time, so it would make sense that they're going to have a little bit of a heavier load. Classrooms, same thing. Classrooms have 40 pounds per square foot. Corridors have 80 pounds per square foot. And corridors on the first floor tend to be even more, 100 pounds per square foot, because that's where a lot of people are, because that's where people are entering and exiting the structure. Does that make sense? Now, I'll tell you, when, when I first started learning about structural engineering, I started learning about these, these loads, I, what is 50 pounds per square foot? Like, I can't, I don't see, I can't visualize that. How, what is, how does that relate in terms of people? So, so I found this, this is a really nice collection of images. This is from the LRFD pedestrian design guide for bridges, so if you're designing a pedestrian bridge. And what they reported are a series of images that kind of relate how many people that would be. So, if you had a six by six foot square, about 12 people in that square, that's about 50 pounds per square foot. This is 100 pounds per square foot, so that's about 24 people in that square. Uh, and this is 150 pounds per square foot. That's 36 people uh, in that square. So, yeah, that, that's a lot of people. That's assuming a healthy weight for an adult. <laughs> yeah. Like within their BMI. But basically, <laughs> well, that's what I said approximately. Okay. <laughs> now, now, this is actually raising an interesting question. So, if you look at a typical classroom in this building and you did the math, so go back here. Um, and for classrooms, the uniform load for a classroom would be 40 pounds per square foot. So 40 pounds per square foot in a room like this that we're in right now would probably be well over 100 people. Okay. Now, what's the likelihood that this build or this room, this room, is going to have 100 people in it? Probably pretty low, right? What these, what these values are reported at, these are upper bounds. These are like the maximum worst case scenarios, which don't get me wrong, you should use. Um, but what's the probability or what's the, you know, the likelihood that these design loads are going to be applied over the entire floor area? It, it's not likely. Okay? So what ASC 7 allows us to do, and I, I want to be clear, this provision has been in place for decades. It certainly isn't a, a, a new idea. Uh, but the, what, the, uh, what ASC 7 allows us to do is to reduce that live load to account for the fact that a given beam or a given column is probably not going to see the full loading uh, at, at a given state. And so the way that you do that is you take the original, the unreduced live load, and you adjust it by what you see here, and we'll talk about where all this stuff comes from here in a second. You adjust it by this, and then that'll generate a reduced live load that you can use for design. So, for instance, if you're designing a beam and you look up the live load from the spec and it's 80 pounds per square foot, and you do the math, instead of using 80 pounds per square foot, you might be able to use like 64 pounds per square foot because of the ability to reduce that live load to account for the, uh, the, the, the probability. All right. So, does, first off, does the idea make sense? We'll talk about the math here in a second, but does the concept make sense? Okay, all right. Now, if the idea makes sense, I want to talk about the math. But before we talk about the math, I need to sort of um, uh, uh, deal with one thing about real-life engineering that you kind of need to, to deal with now. Uh, and this is something that we're going to deal with, not just in this course, but in steel design as well. Uh, we need to sort of get it out of the way. Um, when you all took me for structural analysis, I'd argue that the math was as theoretically straightforward as it could be. I mean, I'm sure there's algebra and there's calculus, but, but the way structural analysis works is it, you, could all, you could sort of derive everything that we did in that class, right? It, you could all boil it down to, to x equals 2. You could all trace it back to a Newton's law or something like that if you wanted to. 
Those, everything that we did in, in structural analysis is sort of what I, I refer to as a mechanistic approach or a me mechanistic style of equations. In other words, you can take it and derive it back to a fundamental principle in physics and, 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 and everything comes from there. This is not a mechanistic equation. Okay, this is an empirical equation. Okay? Real life engineering, you're going to be using empirical equations. And it's just the facts, okay? Whether it's here or it's a, 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 an expression from soil mechanics looking at a bearing capacity or some open channel flow uh, equation trying to account for friction and all that stuff, you're going to be dealing with mechanistic or with empirical equations throughout your career. And the units aren't going to make sense and the equation's going to look like it just came from nowhere and that, that's going to happen. Now, it looks like this equation came from nowhere, but it, but it really didn't. What happens is this, whenever you're dealing with, with empirical expressions, what happens is you'll have folks that go out and instrument real world buildings and they'll collect data and they'll look at all of that data and they'll try and develop an equation that fits that data as closely as possible. Okay? This live load reduction expression, that's what that is. It's a curve fit expression to fit the data of live load reduction that's seen in the field uh, as closely as possible. You can't derive this like you could derive you know, the, the simple or the deflection and simply supported beam it doesn't work like that. Um, and so it's something that you kind of need to, to, to be aware of. Like if you start looking at the ASHTO bridge design spec or, you know, some of the expressions that you see in transportation or hydraulics or environmental, a lot of that stuff's just curve fit expressions. Just pull the data and this works, you know. So that, and, and you kind of need to be, be, be aware of that. That doesn't mean that there aren't theoretical backgrounds and uh, and, and reasons why the equation is structured the way it is, and we can delve into that, but it's just something I want you to be aware of. Okay, now, let's talk about some of the provisions with live load reduction uh, and some of the rules that are in this box here. So, um, in order to compute a, a, a reduced live load, you need three things. You need the live load that you're reducing, you need the tributary area, which hopefully we all know how to uh, 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 compute that now, uh, but you also need what's called a live load element factor. I'll, I'll talk about what that means here in a second, but uh, just just uh, bear with me. Uh, for now, just sort of trust me on that. Now, let's look at some of these bullets over here on the, uh, on the right. So first off, it says live load reduction does not apply for the following. And so the first bullet says if your KLLAT is less than or equal to 400 square feet. In other words, what the spec is saying is that if you have a beam that has a, or a column that has a really, really small tributary area, you might as well not bother performing live load, live load reduction. So if you have a beam that isn't responsible for very much, the spec doesn't let you do this. Okay? Now, um, with some minor, you know, uh, you know provisions or some, some exceptions in the spec, um, live load reduction is not permitted whenever the live load is over 100 pounds per square foot. And I'll give you a real simple example for that. Um, in this classroom, we said, what's the probability that there's 100 people in here? And you said, pretty low. So in other words, it would make sense to reduce live load in here. Now, the live load for classrooms is about 40 pounds per square foot versus the live load for, let's say, a library. The live load for a library is about 150 pounds per square foot. Why do you think the library live load is so large? The books. The books. And what's the thing about the books in the library? They stay there because college students don't check out the books. <laughs> in other words, with classrooms and with us as students and faculty, we're going to be coming and going. But those books are going to stay there, right? So whenever you have a live load that's over 100 pounds per square foot, you don't reduce it. You don't reduce it because those loads are not going anywhere. They're, or A, you're, well actually let me say this, either A, they're not going anywhere, or B, I mean you're talking about some pretty heavy loads, so you might as well design for the, for the, full, uh, for, for the full effect. Does that sound good? Okay, now if one of the things about empirical expressions is that you know, you're trying to curve fit to the data that you collect. And you, it, it, there's a lot of engineering judgment that goes into the development of these equations because you want them to be accurate, but you also want them to be simple. You don't want this really complex equation to try and fit this data. And so sometimes you'll have some, some limits on the results of this equation. Like you can put in some numbers and get some really wonky answers. Like you, I could come up with values here such that I start with 80 pounds per square foot and end up with three. Okay. 
Now, if I'm a structural engineer and I have a beam that's supposed to withstand 80 pounds per square foot and I plug it in this equation and it gives me three, do you really think I should use three? I mean, come on. Like, this is a, a, a beam that's supposed to hold up traffic in a hallway in a building. I'm going to design it for three pounds per square foot. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Just, I mean, imagine if, I, if the building fell over and I said, well, that's what the spec told me to do. Like, come on, you know. So, um, so the spec puts some some caveats on this. So if so, we have these two limits for members supporting one floor and members supporting multiple floors. Now, this is the verbiage from the spec, but let's think about this. Give me an example of a type of member in a building that supports one story of load, and a type of member in a building that supports multiple stories of load. What would support one story? I'll answer that when you answer the next one. I would think of a, a member that supports one story of load as maybe something like a beam. What would support multiple stories of load? A column, right? So with beams, your reduction is limited to 50%. In other words, I don't like if you start with 80 and end with 3, you, you can't do that. So you would have to cap that off at 40. You couldn't go any lower than 50%. For members supporting multiple floors, like a column, you could, you're only limited to the 40% reduction. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So that's just something to, to, to be aware of. Now the one thing I haven't talked about is this live load element factor. They're really easy to, to derive, um, but and, and they're, they're listed here. But really what I want you to understand is the concept. Um, let me show you something. I want to look at the beams in this bay and the beams in this bay. Would you argue that those floor beams have the same tributary area? Okay. Now, how do I draw tributary area? Somebody just remind me. Halfway between the The next one over, right? Okay, so if I was looking at this sort of central beam right here, given my horrible art skills, would you agree that's the tributary area? So this is the tributary area. The tributary area is defined as halfway over. We have another term in structural engineering called the area of influence. And the area of influence, if the tributary area is halfway over, the influence area is all the way over. So for that beam, the influence area would be that. So we would call this a I. Now let me ask you a question. If you took the value of AI and you divided it by the value of AT, what would you get for this beam? Double. So, so this is two, right? So what's the live load element factor for an interior beam? That's what these are. That, that, that's it. So if you look at a column, for instance, like if I'm looking, for instance, at this corner, or, or actually, yeah, let's, let's look at actually really any of the columns. So let's take this column. Here's the tributary area. Here's the influence area. And so if you were to look at those numbers and divide them, the live load element factor would be 4. And so for interior beams, the value is 2. The, for interior columns, the value is 4. All, all of the others have to do with whether or not you have a cantilever slab. So, in other words, you have like a little bit of slab hanging over and you have some slab out in space. And in those instances, you sort of have to use different KLL values. But in most cases, you're either going to use a 2 for beams or a 4 for columns. And that, that's what those numbers are. So I don't want you to think like, ooh, these are like weird numbers. Where are they coming from? It's pretty basic stuff. So. Any questions? Okay. Let me keep this up here for a second. All right. Let's talk about snow. So there's, there's three loads that act up and down with the, with the direction of gravity. We have the dead weight, which is the self-weight of the structure, the live load, which is what the structure is being used for. I'd argue every structure that we ever design has to deal with dead and live. Snow, well, it depends on where it is. Here, yeah, although not right now, 
you know, in, in January, what was it last week, we were in the 70s or something in West Virginia, I don't understand that. Um, but if we were designing a structure like in Miami, you know, probably not. Um, so where does snow load come from? It just comes from collected data from weather stations. So this is one of those things that you sort of have to update regularly with specs because you're just going to have different data from year to year and so you want to make sure that you're using the latest spec. Um, if you've ever heard of the 100 year flood or the you know, uh, 1000 year flood or something like that, basically what that means is you know, the 100 year flood, that's the probability that that will occur within that, uh, that time period. When we design for snow, we, uh, the spec says we design off of the 50-year snow. In other words, the 2% probability that that snow will be exceeded uh, in a given year, or its mean recurrence interval uh, of 50 years. So if you remember that hazard tool that we used in steel design, uh, and for those of you that are in there, we're going to actually use that tool today uh, as well, an MRI of 50 years, that's what we're talking about. Um, now, obviously, your, your ground snow load is a function of your location. So, you know, for instance, in uh, Alabama, Huntsville, Mobile versus Arkansas or Arizona, that's going to change. So, you know, elevation, you know, Flagstaff, Arizona has a higher 2% uh, probability of snow than Tucson uh, and so on and so forth. And if you look at the snow maps, that looks like a mess, right? Uh, it, 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 I mean, it's going to be the case just because of, of, of where you're at. Um, some of the states have unique provisions based off of where they're at in the country. There is one state in the United States that has a snow map all on its own. What state do you think that is? New York. Oh. What state in the United States would have its own dedicated snow map? Oh, Alaska. Alaska. Yeah, so, so there you go. Um, here's where we're at. But be, because of you know how complicated this map is, the idea is why don't we just collect this and, and digitize it? And that's what we have here. So I want to pull this up. This is um, uh, this, these folks at the AT Council have a really neat little tool online. Uh, so I have this here, but I don't want to use that. Don't use I pulled it up here as well. Okay. So you can do this one of two ways. Um, you can search by address, or you can search by latitude and longitude. Um, this integrates with Google Maps, so you can use either one. Um, if you use latitude and longitude, like in America, just make sure that your north coordinate is uh, reported as a positive number and your west coordinate is reported as a negative number. Because think, if you're talking about a compass, west would be negative, east would be positive, and we're in the northwest quadrant of the planet. Um, <clears throat> but for the sake of discussion here, we'll just do address. So let's pick um, something, I don't know. Let's see, where do I want to report? Let's let's try the University of Michigan. So and our chemistry building. There we go. Okay, so this reports wind, snow, tornadoes, so on and so forth. Let's look at the snow. Okay, so if you're designing a structure in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, you're typically going to use a ground snow load of 20 pounds per square foot. If you click the load, see this little blob? That's the area on the snow map that all has the same load of 20 pounds per square foot. So, for instance, like, see how Lincoln is in a different region? So, let's, let's try a new, new address. Let's try just Lincoln, Nebraska. Lincoln, Nebraska. So, Lincoln, Nebraska has a different snow load. It's 25 pounds per square foot because it's a little bit further north. So, it's a little bit further north. It's going to have a little bit of a heavier snow load. Does that make sense? So if I click that, that's a different blob. That's just a different area on the snow map that has that, uh, that reported value. And so if I was designing structures in Nebraska or in Lincoln, let's say, I would use a ground snow load of 25 pounds per square foot. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Go ahead. A question. Like, what if it's like on the border between two of the blobs? That's a great question. If it's on the border between two of the blobs, as a structural engineer, I'd just go with higher one. Because I don't want the structure to fall down because I was trying to save the client money on, on a region like that. I mean, plus or minus five pounds per square foot, I would just uh, bite the bullet. Yeah. That's a great question, though. This is, this is good stuff. But let me say this. Um, very rarely in stuff like that would I use an average. I would pick one or the other. You know, and it would depend on what, what we're talking about. So. Great stuff. Any questions? Okay. 
So um, just so you are aware, um, uh, oops, I don't know why I went back. So. Okay, just so you are aware, what these, um, so this was the last slide we were on here, right here. Um, just so you're aware, what um, uh, the, uh, these maps report are typically values on the ground. So the wind speed uh, maps will report the wind speed on the ground. The, gra the snow load maps will report snow loads on the ground. Uh, and that's because if you're trying to develop a spec, how am I supposed to predict what the snow load is going to be, not only wherever you're at in the country, but at whatever height the building is going to be? You know what I mean? I, I don't know how I'm going to be able to predict that. So whenever you look up a ground snow load, you have to adjust that based on the type of building that you're dealing with. And so there's, this is the equation that we use for, uh, for snow loads on flat roofs. And you're like, wait a minute, aren't roofs like this? For most large-scale construction projects, you'd be surprised how the roofs, not really flat, but they're sloped just enough to handle water drainage. And so, like, if you ever go on the roof of a building like this, it's pretty flat. And so, by and large, you can, you'd be surprised how many uh, projects you'll have where flat roof uh, designs is what you're going to go with. So, whenever you're dealing with, um, with snow loads, you're going to take the ground snow load, and then you're going to adjust it for what would be the load on the roof. Um, and so, really, you need three quantities to be able to do that. You need an exposure coefficient, which we'll talk about here in a second. So, that's whether or not it's in a large city center, if it's in a suburban area, a rural area. It's actually very similar, for those of you that were in steel designs, very similar to the exposure coefficients for wind, right? And it's, all, it's directly related because if, depending upon how the wind hits the building, is going to change how much snow accumulates on the roof, right? So if you have a lot of wind on the snow or on the roof, a lot of that snow is going to blow away, right? So that's going to affect that. Uh, thermal coefficient matters. So if I was designing the roof for a greenhouse and I had a heated roof, snow tends to melt. So that's going to change my snow load on the roof. And then the importance factor, the risk category uh, of the structure. Um, the exposure coefficient, most cases this is going to be equal to 1, um, but it just depends on, on, on what you're talking about. Typically, say you have a roof that's going to um, uh, have like parapet walls around it, so it's not going to be fully exposed, it's going to be partially exposed. And for most partially exposed roofs, uh, this is one, unless you're dealing with like a risk category three structure or, a, or, or sorry, risk category or, or exposure category D structure or, uh, or something like that. Um, exposure categories, so we, uh, if you aren't in steel design, this is the first time that you're seeing this. So not to get too into wind land, but um, uh, when we design for wind, um, one of the things that we have to assess is what type of ca exposure the building is exposed to. There is, there's four categories listed in the spec. There, well, they're really, you know, we have exposure category B, exposure category C, and exposure category D. There really isn't an exposure category A. That's just sort of a placeholder in the spec for if you need to do wind tunnel testing, like if you have a really complicated structure. More often than not, most structural engineers have to decide if they're dealing with category B or category C. Category B is going to be in more of an urban area with, with more densely populated uh, buildings, and category C is going to be sort of out in the middle of nowhere. And, and the idea is this. If I'm designing a five-story building, well, that five-story building is going to see different wind effects if it's in downtown Huntington versus if it's out in the middle of Ona, because there's either stuff around it or there's not. So that's going to affect the wind that the building sees. Now, we're not talking about wind here. We're talking about snow. But the amount of wind that the building sees affects how much snow accumulates on the roof. Does that make sense? Okay. And category D is if the building is not surrounded on all four sides by land, like if it's on the coast. That's going to change its exposure category. And I mean, it's not to say you're not going to have that, but it's pretty rare. Thermal coefficient. Um, obviously, more snow is going to accumulate on a cold roof than a warm roof like a greenhouse. In most cases, the thermal coefficient is 1. There are some instances where you have a freezer building. So if you have a freezer building, you're, you'd actually up your snow load because the roof is really cold and it would accumulate even more uh, uh, condensation and snow and things like that. But in most cases, that's going to be 1. Importance factor. Um, so the importance factor is a lookup, but the importance factor is related to the type of structure that you're designing. Now, if you're not in steel design, 
Um, the ASCE spec um, defines four risk categories that we have to consider when we're designing a structure. And this isn't just for snow. This is for wind and seismic and for a lot of uh, environmental loading conditions. But um, in a nutshell, the importance factor is just, or the, the risk category is just a, um, a, a classification for the type of structure that we're dealing with. And they go from risk category one to risk category four. Risk category one would be structures that if they fall down, yeah, it sucks, but it's probably not going to kill anybody. So like if you have a grain silo out in the middle of nowhere, if that falls down, if it's unmanned, nobody's around, it's probably not going to hurt anybody. So we would consider that a risk category one structure. Risk category four would be a structure, if that structure fell down, not only would it kill people, but it would destabilize an entire community. So we're talking about police stations, fire stations, we're talking about hospitals, 911 centers. I mean, that's a really big deal because that would affect us all. I mean, if St. Mary's, you know, uh, underwent a structural failure, that would affect the whole city, right? So that's a really, really big deal. Um, risk category three is the one, the other one that's remarkable. A risk category three is a structure that either houses a really large number of people, or like a theater, a lecture hall, a, a stadium, something like that, or a building where the people inside have a limited ability to get out. So we're talking about nursing home facilities, we're talking about uh, elementary schools, prisons, um, folks where the people inside is going to be tough to get out. Risk category two is really, if you don't fit in other, any of those categories, your risk category two. So all other structures fit there. And depending upon which risk category you offer, you're in, you're going to up your snow load accordingly. In other words, if you're designing a risk category four structure, you have to design for 20% more snow than the building would actually see, just because of the importance of the structure. So whereas if it's a grain silo, you can actually reduce your load, because, I mean, it doesn't really matter all that much terms of loss of human life. Does that make sense? Now the only other snow related issue, and I'm, and I'm not going to try and get too much into this, but I just want you to be aware of it, is the concept of a snow drift. So remember those um, uh, triangular loads that we did in structural analysis? You're like, oh no, you'll never see that. Well, here's an instance where you do see it. So you have a roof, right? Here it's like the, a gravel, you know, uh, aggregate surface. You've got your curtain wall. Here's you. That's about the best you're going to get. And then you've got your snowflakes falling down. That's about the best you're going to get. But what happens is, okay, so you collect snow on the roof, right? So you got snow collected on the roof. And then the wind blows. And what happens is along this curtain wall, the snow tends to bunch up, right? And so if you look at this beam right here, you have a beam that has a uniformly distributed load from the snow, but it also has this triangular distribution that we call snow drift. Okay, so does that happen? Yeah, it happens. And as you can see, it can cause a bad day. Okay, so you can kind of see it right here on this, this partition. Let me see if I can color that in. You can see you've got that snow drift right there. Okay. So snow drifts happen, okay? And there are ways to compute it and ways to deal with it. It depends on if you're on the windward side or the leeward side of the structure. It depends on your distances and the type of snow that you're dealing with so you can predict how wide and how tall the drift would be and so on and so forth. But um, that, it is an issue that, that you, know, you might have to deal with. Any questions? All right, before we end, uh, we don't have, we didn't quite get to the load combos, but I don't think that would Actually, let, let, me, let me cover that super, super quick. So we have wind, which I'll, I'll talk about when we come back. We have earthquakes, which I'll talk about when we come back. And then we have load combinations. So we have all these different loads we have. So you can look at a given beam and you can compute a dead load, a live load, a snow load, a wind load, etc. We don't just add them up. We have these very, very prescriptive ways of, of adding them up. So we have a series of load combinations that we go through. So typically what we would do is if we would look at, let's say, an interior floor beam and we had all these different loads, we would say, okay, let's look at load combo one. 1 1.4 times the dead, get a value. Then let's look at load combo two. 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live, get a value. Look at load combo three, load combo four, load combo five, load combo six. And do all of those, and of all those, just pick the one that has the worst case scenario. A lot of computer programs will just do all of these combinations for you, 
Um, I highlighted these two in red because of all of the ones that um, we would deal with. The, those two in red are arguably the most common because, again, all structures are going to see dead load and live load. The reason I wanted to cover that is because it's sort of mentioned on your homework. So let me pull that homework up super quick just so that we're all on the same page. So this is the homework that's not here. It's on here. <coughs> I th oh, I have it on my desktop, that's why. So there's three problems. Uh, the first problem, I gave you a, a, a somewhat representative floor system, and I'm having you look at a couple elements on that system, and I want you to determine the dead load and the live load on either an interior floor beam or a column. Then I want you to factor them, so you know, take 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live, and determine the factor of bending moment on a given floor beam and the factored load at the base of a given column. But keep in mind for problem one, you also have to perform live load reduction. So you'll have to take your live load element factor and all of that and reduce that load and then uh, perform that analysis. Problem two, the frame is a little different. So it's an L-shaped structure. So I'm gonna, but there's none of the factoring or the load reduction or any of that stuff. Just take a load of 60 pounds per square foot and determine uh, the fact or the maximum factored bending moment on this on one of these floor beams, the maximum factored shear on this girder, and the factored load at the base of this column, assuming five stories. And other than that, I want you to tell me what the ground snow load is at the University of Maine. So, so that's your homework. So uh, on Wednesday, when we come back, we're not going to pass on Monday. On Wednesday, so the homework is due next Friday, so on Wednesday, I would be prepared to ask questions if you have any. It's not a super, super long assignment, but we only have one day before the, uh, so we can uh, open it up for questions, so make sure you use that time wisely. Without that, that's all I've got. I'll see you all on Wednesday, except for those of you all to be here about optics.